is not all it's not too late but it also isn't too early our one of our good friends talked about the time is right now if you have an old retirement account and you're looking to leverage it and make big returns and not pay taxes this is the way of doing it so What's up, everyone? Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. You got uh, Mr. Greg Hurleen, the founder and owner of Horizon Trust, and you got myself. We're going to be joined by a couple other, well, I'll, I'll say special guests today. We might see Stephen Nagy jumping on for a little bit. He's out uh, doing an event. And also, we've got another special guest, somebody that you all need to get to know if you want to make great money very safely. So he'll be joining us at about 640. But here's, here's the deal. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about something that I think all of you know about, and that is self-directed IRAs. And we're going to talk about you all taking back control of your money. And it's interesting. I get these calls all the time, and people say that they've got an Edward Jones account. They got a, a Merrill Lynch account. I heard that one the other day. They got a Schwab account, a TD Ameritrade account, and there's nothing wrong with any of those. The problem is, is when you do traditional brokerage accounts, which would be any of those, it could be a Vanguard, a Fidelity, any of those, you are capped to invest your money in only what they make available to you, which for all intents and purposes is usually mutual funds, stocks, bonds, ETFs, and various traditional financial products. What you're not going to have available to you in any of those platforms, including the ones that they conveniently call self-directed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have seen those, the Fidelity self-directed account. It is not a self-directed account. It just allows you to self-direct into whatever traditional financial investments you want to invest in. But you know, a lot of the things that we are able to invest in are not quite available to you inside those. But in a self-directed IRA, you have the opportunity to do all sorts of things. You could invest in, like that video was commenting and joking about, a dairy cow. You could milk the cow and sell the milk. Not that any of you would. You could invest in private hedge funds, like the one that I just used my self-directed IRA to invest in. I know you guys can't really see this, but the returns have been really good. So I, I just started this. It was a small investment of 50 grand. Started on the first, and you know today's the twenty-first. There's not been one day of loss. My worst day is nine dollars and twenty-eight cents. But I mean, I want you to just look here. See that little line there? This line here. See how like that's a sorry. I'm kind of trying to draw it here. See how it's a nice straight line up. How many of you have a stock account that looks like that? Any of you have an account that just sort of just steadily just goes up and up and up? Usually your stock account actually mimics something that looks more like this, right? And, and today, if any of you were paying attention to the carnage in Wall Street, it looks a lot like that. So if I were to ask you, which one do you want? It's kind of like that class. Do you want the straight line that just continues to go up and up? Or do you want this squiggly line that looks a lot like your heartbeat? And you know what? That's when your heart stops beating. I think I, I know the answer for all of you. Well, if that's you and you've got an old 401k, an old IRA or something, you are literally one step away from having your money grow like you just saw my money growing or like Greg's money growing or like anyone on here who has a self-directed IRA. So real quick, you know, as we kind of jump into this, I just want to do a little bit of a roll call here and then I'm going to turn it over to Greg. How many of you right now have a self-directed IRA, a self-directed Roth IRA, or a solo K. In the chat, what I'd like you to do is just put I or A-Y-E. I just want to see who's got uh, who's who's got this happening already. All right, it's good. So we got a, a bunch of people. Great. Now we've got almost 200 people on here. So, okay, we got some people saying nope. So all right, let's let's do the next round. Now what I'd like to know is how many of you have an old 401k from a prior employer that for some reason or another, you decided to just leave your money at the place you no longer work at. If you do, and you know, that's okay. You guys can be honest with yourselves. Put 401k in the chat right now. This is an old 401k at an old employer that you know. Whoa, my goodness. All right, good. And also too, if you have, if you rolled it into an IRA, you can put IRA in the comments as well, as long as it's not a self-directed. So as you'll notice with, with 200 people here, we got 
a lot of them because it just came out pretty hot and heavy there. 403B, same thing. So 403B, 457, 401K, wh whichever of those, I mean, any of those would count. You can see most people on here have some form of traditional retirement account. And it makes all the sense in the world. That's what we've been taught to do. And Greg, I don't know when you were taught to start putting your money in a 401k or if you were one of the, the lucky few that were not taught to do that. I know my grandmother, you know, my late grandmother, my dad's mom. I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in her trailer, which I spent a lot of time when I was a child, you know, in the trailer park. And I remember her coming up to me and I think I was maybe 16 or so, 15 or 16. And she says, Chris, I want to teach you something. When you get a job, I want you to ask them if they have a 401k. I said, okay, Grandma, what's a 401k? She said, it's the right retirement account. Just ask them if they have one. And I said, all right, Grandma, ask. So memory hook, when I get a job, ask if they've got a 401k. And then she proceeded to tell me, and if they do have a 401k, ask them if they match. And I, I said, Grandma, what does that mean? Well, if you put money in, they give you free money is basically her, in her words, what she said. I said, okay, grandma. So when I started in the financial world, the first place where they'd actually have a qualified retirement plan, I asked that. I, his name was John Foster, or actually Kamal. That's right. It was Kamal uh, before John came in. I asked him, I said, so Kamal, like, does this firm offer a 401k? And he said, we sure do. It's one of the best in the industry. Great. And then he starts telling me a little bit about it. I said, all right, Kamal, you know, what about a match? Do you guys match? Yes, we do. We match 4% dollar for dollar. So now let's, let's think about that. That means if I take 4% of my paycheck and I put it into this 401k, that firm, that company would then match and give me 4%. So how much do you think I decided right out of the hole to put into that 401k once it was available? And it took six months. They, they wouldn't allow us to put money in for six months. 14%. That was the number I put in. Now, what was your number, folks? How much were you putting in your 401k? You can put it over in the chat. What percentage were you putting in? I went 14%. Where did I come up with that number? I have no freaking clue. It just popped out of my head. I knew I got a 4% match, okay? And then I knew I wanted to put 10% in. So somehow I just combined the two and said 14 sounds like a good number. Holy cow, 35%. Oh, it's like, a, like an auction. We got eight, we got 20, we got 10, we got 35, we got 20, 14, six and matching, 15. All right, so any of you that are putting in like 7, 20, 35, <laughs> holy smokes, 8, 16, are they matching you 16%? Are they matching you 8? Are they matching 35% these days? I'm way out of the loop, Greg. I didn't know they were matching this much. I don't think that, I don't think they match 35%. Oh, wow. So why would you put more than the match in? Because if you really think about that, you're putting money into an account that you don't have the ability to invest in anything other than what they tell you to invest in. And I'll bet you most of your 401ks have just a few simple mutual funds you can invest in. And most of them probably say freedom date fund, target date fund, or something like that, because those are the highest feed funds inside the platform. I got lucky. 2014, me and my wife are at a seminar, a real estate seminar. We had just paid a bunch of money to go through this really fancy real estate coaching program. And I'll never forget me and Larissa, front row, front right, sitting there. And this handsome tall guy gets up on stage with his shorter buddy, Mike. And that was Greg here. And they do their whole pitch talking about money. And I'm like kicking Larissa under the thing, being like, Larissa, these are the money guys. Like, I got to listen. I was an advisor at the time. But the way that they talked about money was completely foreign to me. They were talking about being the bank. Greg made a comment that I'll never forget. He said, the ultimate in real estate, I'm like, oh, it's got to be apartment buildings. Honey, it's the flipping house thing we're doing. And he says, the ultimate in real estate is being the bank. And as soon as he said that, I'm like, man, I had that all wrong. And I had no idea what that meant. I'm like, honey, all we need to do is flip a bunch of houses, make a million bucks or more. And then we can also be the bank like this wealthy guy up on stage. That's the first time. I heard Greg talk. I have photos of me and Larissa posing with Greg and with Mike at that event. And that's when it all changed, folks. So, Greg, I'm going to have you take it from there and just kind of explain a little bit about like your experience with this and how you came about it. But that was where I landed. And, folks, nothing's ever been the same ever since that. And this is what I mean by nothing the same. You see, my money has just sort of slowly just gone up and up and up. And I wouldn't even call it slow. It's just been a straight line instead of that bumpy, turbulent roller coaster. So, Greg, I'm going to pin you up there and let you roll. 
Well, well, look, first, let me, uh, I, I do remember those days and uh, 2014, you said is when we met, I, 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 they, they actually put me on stage in between Christina and Tarek back when they were together, for those of you that watch the reality uh, TV, because it's real. Uh, they were up before me. And I think the guys after me were the flipping Boston guys. And so I was like, <laughs> Well, I hope someone wants to hear from me because I'm not on TV. And uh, so I, I'm glad I got one fan out of that. I think maybe a few others, too. But um, I do remember that time. And uh, I actually, on that note, I remember going to dinner. It might have been that event or maybe a, a, a year or six months before that. But I went to dinner. Typically, you go. the speakers sometimes will go to dinner. And I was with the Flipping Boston guys. Anyone, anyone remember the Flipping Boston guys, reality TV show guys? Anyone in the chat? Nobody. I mean, this is this is East Coast stuff. So, all right, there you go. I, at least I got one person there. A couple of them. great guys. Love the guys. And I remember going to dinner, and they were kind of getting to know me, right? And they were like, "So, what does he do?" You know, kind of. You know, look when you're on TV, and I would tell these guys today because I, I can. You know, these guys are good guys, but uh, you know, they they were kind of judge. I don't know if judging, but you know, you know, trying to figure out who I was a little bit. Why I'm at the table. Uh, yeah, no, Than and the boys too. Um, so, uh, it, so that being said, so, you know, someone asked about like money and, and, and I remember, um, was it Dave, right? Dave's at flip. Yeah. I haven't talked to Dave in a long time. So Dave said, Dave said something at the table. He said, if you find the right deal, the money always just arrives. And I was a bit offended by that because I looked at Dave and I was like, Dave, so you just say, if, if, if you find a good deal, all of a sudden, just the money starts pouring in. And, uh, and Dave said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, brother. With this, you know, he definitely had to use the F word in every sentence because he's from Boston. I said, hold on a second. I said, tell me about your first few deals. How easy was the money then? And he actually, Dave got quiet for one of the first times. Like, well, yeah, man, you're right. Like the first few deals, it's hard. And so I said, look. People need to understand how to find money and where it's at to, to fund your business or to fund your real estate or to fund your cattle, as you explained. And so, uh, I, look, Chris, I, what I wanted to share in, in the beginning is, and I saw some names there that are familiar. Katie, I saw you in there, too. Uh, look, uh, this is near and dear to my heart because what it has done for me and those that I know has changed my life forever. And I was just a nobody. When I say nobody, of course, I was somebody, but I had no money, didn't come from money. Um, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to fund or partner my deal, uh, partner, you know, get partners for my deals. And so so this this subject is near and dear to me because I, I didn't have money. And as as good as my deals were, like Dave talked about, money wasn't just pouring in. So so if, if any of you on this call here are listening today and are, are one of those people that say, well, yeah, you know, money doesn't just pour in when I find a deal, then this subject matter is important for you. Then the other side of the subject matter is kind of how I got started when I learned about self-directing. My first, my first kind of conversations in real estate, uh, because I couldn't get a loan, couldn't find money, um, uh, my first conversations were, how do I find money? And I learned at 23 uh, I was I was a force to learn because I couldn't get a loan and my family had no money. Uh, I learned about the subject about self-directing. So my first experience of doing my first real estate transaction, there you go, Dave Seymour, thank you. My first experience in real estate was somebody lending me $60,000 from their IRA and self-directing it to me. When I say to me, to do my first deal, they lent me 100% of the proceeds I needed, my first little condo, and I flipped it. And ever since then, I haven't looked back. That, and, and, and I remember that example. I gave that guy 75% of my profits on that deal, and I got 25%. And I, by the way, don't judge me because I gave out so much. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again. I gave him 75%. He made $12,000 in 90 days, and I made $4,000 in 90 days. Looking back on that, that's when I kind of proved to myself and to this investor that my process of finding a deal using someone else's self-directed, someone else's retirement funds to fund my deal truly worked. And so I did that over and over and over again until I finally opened up my own retirement account. And then I started lending, which is what Chris is talking about, because I always just thought it was really cool that this gentleman who lent me, he had the perfect scenario. 
I found the deal. I had to deal with the title companies, realtors, contractors, selling the project. And at the end of the day, he just put up his money passively and got a check. And I just knew at some point in my career, I wanted to be that guy that was putting up and lending the money. And so that's what I focus on now with my own personal retirement funds. And so, so look, this subject is, is truly near and dear to me because I, I remember where I started and where I was, you know, I, I, I didn't realize the power of self-directing. And so, uh, like Chris said, you know, because, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to really, unless Chris tells me, he wants me to go over some PowerPoint slides. I'd rather talk about real examples and talk about some real numbers. I want to back up. Self-directing, for those of you that are new to this, and, and there's a no, I know there's a lot of veterans, but let me just real quick say, this is something that's been around since the 70s. So what we're talking about, this is nothing new. It, when I was in my 20s, 21, you know, 22 years ago doing this, it had already been around for 20 years before that. And so typically the wealthy and the, and the politicians and the people that create these rules, um, uh, these, these hacks, if you want to call it, they're using these. The, the rich are getting richer. And so there's no reason why individuals like you and me and others can use these same rules um, that apply to your retirement accounts. And so one other thing I want to mention about self-directing and, and what self-directing is, is basically investing in alternative assets, investing in assets that aren't uh, marketable securities like the stock market and mutual funds, bonds, indexes, et cetera. So when we talk about the subject also, it is not for everybody. And what I have found, most people that are listening to me or in these different podcasts, I have found that they typically are entrepreneurs. Uh, you that are listening are typically people that are investing in alternative assets or in real estate or want to manage your own money. And so this, this probably does apply to you. For 90% of America or more, this does not apply to them. In fact, if anything, it might apply to them because they might be your future banker. There's over 90 million which is $5.4 trillion, but 90 million IRAs in the United States, 90 million. So basically almost a third of the US population and probably at least a third of the participants listening here today um, have an IRA or an old 401k from a previous employer and can use those funds to be in real estate or to be in, <laughs> we'll keep using the cow analogy, um, or an ice rink, or in business, or in Bitcoin, uh, or, or metals, precious metals, alternative assets. I think one of the big things that people don't know is that they can do it. And I think I even saw someone comment earlier, which I appreciate is, Chris, you weren't dumb. I think they're talking about your story. Uh, they, you just were uninformed. You, 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 you were uninformed. You didn't know your options, like most of America. And look, financial advisors in general don't want you to invest in a self-directed retirement account because then they don't get their fees. I always, I'm a big fan of investing in, in what you know, but also controlling your own money. No one cares more about your money than you do. When you self-direct, you're able to pick different investments, pick uh, different asset classes that you might understand. And so it's, yeah, I can give you several, several examples. And Chris, when you tell me, I, I'll give some more, but I, the most important thing is I, if, if you're one of those people that are you know investing in, and I know Chris, you and I have used this analogy in, in, in the stock, HAP, it's your favorite stock, uh, hope and pray. You keep putting your money in there and you're hoping for different results. That, that stock, uh, I mean, it's, it's doing the same thing for you over and over again. So if, if you want to stop the bleeding and invest in, in yourself, I'm not saying invest in me. I, there, by the way, there is, I have no investment. Um, I'm, there's no investment pitch at all. I'm saying invest in what you know, what makes you feel comfortable, what makes you sleep better at night. And that's where I have found my success. I invest in things that I understand. And so, and I say, I like to say I invest in rocks and not stocks uh, for me. That's, that's something that I know when the market changes, even the stock market changes. You know, these a home does not move uh, up and down. You know, I'm sorry, when it doesn't move up and down, it does not just vanish like a stock market. When e Elon Musk wakes up in the morning and he says, the, you know, he says that, you know, I've got another kid, um, a 14th kid with my 10th wife, you know, all of a sudden the stock market changes. <laughs> the Tesla stock's going down. And all he did is just say, you know, I've got another kid coming. And so uh, I don't like that kind of fluctuation in my retirement account. And so um, when self directing, you know, you can pick and choose what you want or pick your partners, which I think is probably one of the most critical things is you get to pick trusted people that you might know 
or you might be able to buy your own real estate. So Chris, I went on like tons of tangents because I get excited about this. Uh, probably started when I talked about Dave uh, Seymour. Thank you for ever said Seymour. Um, Dave and Pete, uh, those are guys are blast from the past. Um, and Christina and Tark, I remember the same thing with those guys. I mean, I remember having long conversations with Tark um, about about money and deals and and I remember, you know, when he was up on stage talking about how many homes he did, and he was doing all of them, you know, using his LLC, and he was paying taxes on all of his gains. So, anyways, yeah, it's it's uh, this is this is real life stuff that everybody should be doing if they are taking action and want to pick their own investments. If that's not you, then you stick with the HAP or you stick with the financial advisor. And there's nothing wrong with that as well. Um, so, anyways, I'll stop, Chris. Um, it, uh, I, I got excited and I went a couple of different places on that. So go oh, ahead. I think that's great. And I, I was, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm over here banging away as fast as I could trying to keep up with questions. And thank you all for putting your questions in the Q and a, uh, we will answer every single one of them. Some of them I'm kind of answering in private messages, but I also want to answer them publicly so people can learn. Let's see, Greg, do you work at horizon trust? Uh, Kelly, Greg owns horizon trust, but he does also work there. Yeah, there's no question do, about that. I don't know. I got I got my team who might not say I work there, but I definitely do uh, night and day. And well, look, and I, I will say, even though that's a simple question, yeah, I, I own it. I started Horizon Trust as a default because I was in the real estate. I'm a real still a real estate investor, but after eight or nine years of referring clients to other trust companies, I was disappointed with the service and the speed. And so, speed in real estate, as most of you know, can can kill a deal. And so I was trying to do deals or partner with my my investors on deals. And by the time the money would come over, uh, it was too late. The deal was gone. And so we we really specialize. There is nobody quicker in the industry on getting money to our company from your other accounts to fund your you know your own account. But then also when you put your request in to have the money sent out to title or to wherever it's going to go, we're the quickest. And we don't try, you know, there's no expedite. I mean, there is an expedite fee if you want to make sure it's same day, but we expedite everything. Everything's within, we say two to three days. I, I mean, our team is good. We do everything pretty much within two days. And that's important. Speed, you know, an extra one or two days of interest literally is could be hundreds of dollars. And sometimes an extra saving you an extra couple of weeks could be thousands of dollars. And so speed's very important to us and accuracy. That's that's what we're really good at. Yeah. And, I, and I'll second that. I mean, you know, I was mentioning this hedge fund, you know, this deal, you know, it went from 50,000 minimum to a hundred and I needed to get this money in. And within, it was literally like a week and, you know, Horizon Trust team got it done, got the money in there. You know, there's so many examples, but um, I love that somebody on here is a school teacher and, you know, we love our school teachers because that's the future of our youth. You know, actually Derek was saying that he, he wanted to do an example of a school teacher. I don't know if I have an example of a school teacher, quote unquote, um, because m most of the time when school teachers are working as school teachers, they put money in a 403B. That would be them contributing their money. 403B is the same as a 401k or the same as a 457. Just so you all know, like 401k is a profit company. 403B under IRS code is a nonprofit company, which, which would be a school or, you know, things like that. And a 457 is, is a government entity. So they're all the same thing. They're all taxed the same, same tax rules. They just have different coding for how they work. So, and then Derek, I, I, you know, all teachers for the most part, depending on, you know, what tier you're at, um, a chunk of your paycheck goes to your pension. Now the pension is different because that's a defined benefit plan. What we're talking about is defined contribution plans, meaning, um, all the ones we're talking about, IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, that's you putting money in. You're defining your contribution. A pension, like a, a simplified employee pension, a SEP, as many of you know it, or, or your pension is a defined benefit. So, you know, they have, and it's kind of weird now, it's so weird from what I've learned, like bene defined benefits, like your pension, normally employees wouldn't have to contribute to them, but now because they've underfunded them and made so many mistakes, now they require you to fund them. But there's a benefit that when you retire, you'll get X amount per month or a lump sum or whatever option you take. So that's a defined benefit that you're you're putting into. So there, there are two different things. But if you leave that teaching job, you can roll that pension into a, an IRA and you could roll that 403B into an IRA. And here what we're talking about is self-directed IRAs. So not to confuse anybody because a self-directed IRA in the capacity of what we're talking about 
in, in the ones that, that, that are truly self-directed, like Horizon Trust, you know, the, the only difference is the custodian. TD Ameritrade, someone mentioned that they said that they had a self-directed TD Ameritrade account. And they said, you know, I'm allowed to invest in anything that TD Ameritrade allows. Quote, anything that TD Ameritrade allows, which is traditional financial products, stocks, bond, mutual funds, ETFs, maybe REITs and a couple other things. Maybe you can do uh, limited partnership energy companies and things like that, but it, it's limited. Where a true self-directed IRA, you could do things like what we're going to talk about. I could lend money to Greg for a real estate deal that he's doing. I could lend money to Derek, you. I could lend money to you from my self-directed IRA. I could lend it to your company so that you then could flip a house. You know, I could do that private hedge fund, which is not available to anyone in the public. Uh, I could buy real estate. Somebody on here has a self-directed IRA and they have a checking, uh, an LLC and check writing privileges. So they bought real estate within their self-directed IRA. We'll, we'll hit on that a little bit. So again, you know, you just got to look at it and anything that you can really think of outside of collectibles and you can't buy life insurance. I know somebody was asking about is, you know, self-directed IRAs the same as the infinite banking concept? No, they're qualified versus non-qualified. So we cannot own life insurance inside of the self-directed IRA, but there's really so much you can do. And literally like the reason a lot of you don't know about this, if you don't, so actually real quick, how many of you do not know about self-directed IRAs or no one's ever told you about them? Put I in the chat, but you, do you all know why? Greg, do you want to you wanna talk about why only 4% of the entire qualified retirement plan market knows about self-directed IRAs? Well, I think, you, I, I think you might have been answering questions because I did answer this question, actually. But I can, I'll, I'll say it again for those you didn't hear. Most people don't know for the most part because your advisor either isn't aware or they don't want you to move your account. There's no advantage of teaching you how to move your money into a self-directed account. So I did answer this earlier, Chris, but I, I want to actually answer something a little bit different. I've had a lot of phone calls with people and my staff has as well. It says, man, I love this, but do I have to talk to my financial advisor if I'm going to move this? Because he's my brother-in-law or he's my friend or I've been with him 15 years and I really want to do this. Look, there's two answers to that. One, you can just rip off the Band-Aid and do it. You don't have to necessarily talk to your financial advisor and we can help you move the money over. But number two is what we're talking about here is investing in different assets and you don't have to move all of your account over. So let's say you have a, a TD Ameritrade or a Schwab or a Fidelity, wherever you're at, or for old 403B or old 401k. You can move a portion of it over. So if you've got a $100,000 account, you can move $50,000 over. And actually, it's not necessarily a bad idea. Now you can kind of test it out and see how your advisor does against what you do in, in your uh, alternative ask. So you definitely can be doing that. But that, you know, look, typically your advisor just doesn't want you to know. That's the typical answer. Yeah. And let me tell you why from an ex-advisor, 16 years I spent doing what Greg's Recovered. talking about, being Recovered. a financial advisor. And I remember, I remember when we heard about self-directed IRAs and I went to, at that time, it was, his name was John, was the managing partner. I said, hey, you know, I heard about these self-directed IRAs. He's like, yeah, you can't do those. And, and he said, it's called selling away. Now, right off the bat, I knew what selling away was. I'm like, oh, bad, Good jail time, like lose my job. I'm not even going to talk about them. Do you know what the real reason was? It wasn't selling away. It was selling away because that company couldn't, couldn't make money selling self-directed IRAs. Brokers, financial advisors, financial planners can't get paid on a self-directed IRA. So now do you understand why you haven't heard about it? It's not because it's bad. It's actually the exact same thing as your regular IRA, identical under IRS code. The only difference is the custodian and what they allow and, and how it works there. That's the only difference. Under IRS code, literally, the, all the rules are identical. The rules are the same for a Roth. The rules are the same for a, a, an IRA, traditional IRA. So. Really, the only difference was, as an advisor, I couldn't get paid, which means the brokerage couldn't get paid, or the broker-dealer, I should say. So therefore, oh no, you can't talk to your clients about that. That's selling away. Hold on, let me change the script. You can't talk to your clients about this because you can't get paid, nor can we. So that's bad. You only got to talk to them about things that we make money on. Are we clear? Because mm -hmm. that is literally, I know Greg was being nice about it, but I'm telling you how it really was. We couldn't talk about it because it was probably a good thing for all of you. Not to uncover that one too much, but that's a lot of the reasons why you don't know about a lot of the things you don't know about, like maybe the infinite banking concept or why your advisor never knew how to design a whole life that reduced their commission so that you had more cash value. I mean, I could go on. 
Why is it that you never were told about private lending and mimicking what a bank does? Could you ever think it's because somebody couldn't get paid? And when your advisor and you tell them about this self-directed IRA thing, if you ask them, they're going to be like, oh, no, don't do that. That's too risky. So hold on a second. Can we please define risk here real quick? Greg, this is my favorite thing. I love it when advisors say, oh, that's really risky. Okay, let's just use one example of a self-directed IRA. And folks, I'm going to let all, you, all of you be the judge on risky versus not risky. Option A traditional financial model. You're going to invest in a diversified portfolio of mutual funds and ETFs and stocks and index funds. And this thing has historically averaged a return of 8%. You can do no wrong. You get your statement today. I'm just picking on today because the market just literally fell apart a little bit. And you look at your statement and you are down 26%. Oh, have any of you looked at your statement lately? I'm just asking for a friend. I mean, really, have, have you looked? Because it's down probably a lot and it's going to get worse. So right there, okay, that's the traditional market risk. You go wherever the market goes and you have no control over that outside of maybe you can diversify out some of the risk. You can maybe add some bonds to that to diversify out some, but there's, there's that risk. You all are witnessing it and going through it today. Plan B, I'm going to do self-directed IRAs. I'm going to take my money and I'm going to lend it through private money club. I'm going to go through here and I'm going to look at all the deals in private money club and I'm going to find one that really fits my fancy. So I'm going to go here, I'm going to browse through deals and I just want to find one that makes sense. 14% fix and flip first lien, 50% LTV. We can, we can do either. We can do the 20% banger or the 14%, but I like this because 50% LTV means, I think in, in how he's describing it, is that he's borrowing 50% of the loan to value. Now, if you look at a bank, a bank will lend usually 80% loan to value. You all know this, your house, right? 20% out of your pocket, 80% the bank funds, loan to value. So here he's looking for 50%, which tells me if it's a first lien position, meaning I'm in first position, if this guy, what's his name, uh, Bo? Yeah, Bo. If Bo doesn't pay me my monthly payments, I'm the only one in line. I can foreclose, I can own this beautiful little house, and what does he say this house is worth? Worth about 200,000 bucks. So I got 100,000 in equity based on what he's saying, which means he's also putting the rest of the money in himself if it's only 50% LTV or he's putting some money in. So now I do this deal. I lend Bo $100,000. And what's, what's Bo willing to pay me? Was it 14%? And he pays me 14%. Every month I start getting a check. Okay, every month I'm getting a check. And then all of a sudden Bo decides the something went wrong, the market fell apart and he, he stops paying me. I'm just playing bad, right? I'm not saying Bo's gonna do that, but let's just pretend he did. Now I've got to go and get an attorney and I gotta foreclose on the property. Pain in the butt, right? But I do, I go through the process, I foreclose and now I own this beautiful little house right here that has a valuation, says, says Bo and his numbers here, the financials of roughly $200,000, okay? So, I then sell the house for 150 grand because I just want to fire sell it. I fire sell for 150. Heck, even let's just say I fire sell for 100. I mean, who's keeping track? I got the, a couple monthly payments at 14% and then I fire sell it at 100. How much did I lose, folks? Did I lose anything? Time, maybe, maybe a couple interest payments, but literally, like for the amount I lent, 100 grand, and the amount I got back, which was more than 100 if you include the interest payments I got, did I lose any money? No, I came out ahead. I didn't really make as much as I was hoping to if Bo just paid me all my payments, but which one was riskier? The stock portfolio that was had an average rate of return of 8%, but now I'm down 20 some. And you know, are, are any of you in a secured position in your stock portfolio? In other words, um, Apple's down today. Can you call Apple and uh, you know, whoever you want to get a hold of, call the CFO over there and say, hey, listen, I just got a statement. And I own a bunch of that Apple stock and it went down 20% today alone. What are you guys going to do about that? You guys going to make me whole? What are they going to say to you folks? So when I look at two of these options, okay, Bo's deal here, which my advisor says, oh, that's so risky. It's so risky. You can't do that. Or your stock portfolio, your mutual fund portfolio, you literally have no security. You have no tangible asset backing it. Which one's more risky? I mean, does, does that make sense, folks? I mean, sometimes I just try to think logically, but literally like I'll take the plan B every day 
And I'll give the big middle finger to the advisor that said that that was too risky because the way I look at it is I was really well protected in that. I had a tangible asset securing my money and I did it all inside of a self-directed IRA. Very simple. And a lot of people are probably thinking, oh yeah, but I wouldn't know how to secure it. I wouldn't know how to do all the paperwork. Great. We have a coaching program that teaches you how to do all that. They handhold you through all of it. But anyway, like Greg, you do a lot of this. Like, and I know you also invest in stocks. So, you know, when, when people are looking at, you know, stocks or, or do the self-directed, do I do stocks or do I do the self-directed thing that I know no nothing about? Like, I think a lot of people think they have to make a decision. It's this or that, but it's this and that, because you can buy stocks inside your self-directed. You can lend money on that deal that you just saw in private money club. You could lend money to our special guest whenever he gets here, who you'd probably love lending money to him because he's incredibly secured. You, you have the choice of doing whatever you want because it is you in control of your money and it is you self-directing your money. So when your financial advisor tells you it's too risky, it's simply because they have no idea what it is. And that is it. Yeah. And I think, and I, by the way, I think I saw Rob is here. I, what, I, one thing I'll share with you though, here, the power of this, and, and Chris, you and I before used the the website before the uh, Dave Ramsey uh, calculator, just yep. the calculator, no, nothing more than, the, than that, but, but basically doing what we're talking about inside of a retirement account rather than outside. I saw a lot of people comment as well saying, Hey, what if you don't have a retirement account? You also, if you don't have a retirement account, you can set up, we help people set them up all the time, a self directed account from the beginning, from scratch. And so therefore, any investing you do, you can do it inside of the retirement account. And so the difference uh, of investing in, inside of a retirement account or, or out is considerably different. If Chris and I, and, and it'd be fun to kind of do this with after maybe Rob gets going on here for a minute, but uh, if, if he and I both invest in one of Rob's, let's say investments, and I do it inside my self-directed IRA, here we go. Here's a good example. For those of you, it's htccalculator.com. It's just a link over to Ramsey's calculator, which is great. And basically, let's just walk through this for a second. If you're 45 years old, you want to retire at 60, and let's say you have $100,000, like let's just throw in $100,000. And that you can contribute um, two thousand a month or a thousand a month, a thousand. Let's go less, thousand a month, because you want you want to catch up. And let's just say that the return is twelve percent. Yeah, let's do twelve because I know a guy who's sitting on here right now that's happy to pay you twelve percent on your hundred grand. So, so what is that? So, in fifteen years, you start with a hundred thousand dollars. Look, well, wow, it's actually quite perfect. You would have put in one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and you'd have a little over a million dollars. And that's it. That's basically at 12%. But let's just say, why don't you just change that number to uh, 16%? There you go, 16. That's it almost doubles just by going 16. So let's just, just for, for an example purpose, let's just say both Chris and I both make 16% of our money, compounded interest for me, not him, because he does his outside of an IRA. So therefore, he's paying taxes on his gains every time he sells an asset or earns interest on it. I'm doing it inside. The difference is I'd end up having $1.8 million in my retirement account, and he'd have close to about $1.1 million in because he's having to pay taxes on his gains every single year. And we could be investing in the exact same deal. Where I'm going with this a little bit and teeing up Rob is he Rob's got some deals that I think pay around this, maybe more, 15, yep. maybe more, 10 to 6. I don't know what the percentage is. We'll go over that in a minute. But if, if Chris and I invest, and do what we're talking about right now, me and my IRA and my self-directed and Chris outside of it, getting the same exact return. The difference in 10 or 15 years is I'll have double the amount of money in him just by doing it in a tax sheltered um, product. That's it. And this is the thing that most people just don't think about, or they just keep investing in five years later. Like, well, I don't really like that idea because Greg, if I do it inside of my IRA, I can't touch it till I'm 59 and a half. I'm not saying put all of your money in an IRA. I'm saying that you should put a portion of your money, or if you already have a retirement account, use that and maximize that in your investing. Too many people just because they can't touch it till they're 60, they're like, oh, I'm going to do that retirement thing later. And then it becomes too late. If, if I wish I would have started my retirement account at 23, I started at 26, 27, which is still pretty dang young for most people. My son, who Chris knows very well, he started his account at 20. You know, and, and so it is not all, it's not too late, but it also isn't too early. Our, one of our good friends talked about the time is right now.
If you have an old retirement account and you're looking to leverage it and make big returns and not pay taxes, this is the way of doing it. Anyways, thanks, Chris. Uh, I think we're going to bring on our guest, right? We are. Yeah, we got uh, Rob coming in. Rob, you're in you're in Hawaii, right? So you came. Yeah, Nicole and Harrington Maui right, right now. We moved from Northern California to um, Utah about a year and a half ago, and it is snowing and cold. And a week ago, we were both kind of just like, we got to get out of here. So we we actually used a bunch of points uh, that we have for Marriott and um, and Delta because we use a lot of uh, you know credit cards to pay for things as we do a lot of development intentionally so we can do things like this last minute. So we planned this trip a week ago, and so we're in Maui. It's beautiful outside. You can kind of see. I it's not the, the fake background. I can see the suntans, and you know I'm sitting here with the pasty white from Buffalo, which we're <laughs> never sunny here in the winter. But no. uh, a little bit jealous, a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, the, the, the cool part is, is, you know, when, when we first met, I don't remember how long ago it was, but we met actually at a mastermind and we started talking about your business and the developments you do. And it was just, an, it was just fascinating. And I, and I remember, you know, you telling me a little bit of, you know, we never have any problem finding money for our deals. Cause I always like talking about money. I mean, I think anybody on here, Greg even knows it. Like I just never shut up when it comes to money. I'm just like, so how do you fund your deals? Where's the money come from? I'm always wondering, you know, I had a hidden reason why I was asking, but He's like, oh, we never have a hard time finding money. We use institutional lenders and banks and, and they do this. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, those pesky banks I hate them. And I bet you he does, too. So as we got talking, I started telling him about this community that I built where there's a bunch of private lenders. And, you know, they all would love to get in on deals like what Rob's doing because they typically have access to, you know, fix and flips and smaller deals, but not these giant, really awesome, fun development deals that you're doing, like the Marlboro Man deal that you guys got now. And, Seriously, like they bought land from the Marlboro Man's son. I mean, I'm not joking about that. But, you know, as I'm talking to him, he's kind of, he's not giving me the, the brush off because Rob's just a nice guy. Rob and Nicole is just such nice people. But you can just tell he's kind of like, yeah, yeah, all right, great, great. All right, cool. Yeah, well, that sounds awesome. Like, you know, hey, if, if you want to try, kind of like, if you want to try to raise money, but, you know, we need like tens of millions of dollars and, you know, your little community, like, I don't know, a million, that'd be great. And, uh, you know, so he gave me a shot and I think, I think we've raised over 20 million through private money club. And a lot of that comes from a lot of the folks that are on here. Like you can see a bunch of people are saying hello yeah. to you. Um, but we've got several people on here that, you know, that do your deals and have lent you from their self-directed IRAs. One of them commented in saying, you know, they did a, a Rob Fuller deal at, with their self-directed IRA at 15%. So what I'd like to do is just turn it over to you and Nicole just for a second to talk a little bit about your experience working with the clients that have self-directed IRAs, how it really gives them options that they'd never have in the traditional financial world. So I'll, I'll pin you guys up and you guys can take it from there. Well, and I, I don't want to talk too much because I tend to do that anyway, but I will tell you just to speak specifically about Horizon. And I don't know if everybody here is already using Horizon, but we work with clients who have money to all different kinds of, uh, of companies. And I'm not just saying this because Greg is on, but Horizon is truly the easiest for us to work with. Yeah. By far. Because it's the they'll Stream, at, streamlined process. Yeah. Just they've dialed and, it in. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, actually. When we work with some of these other people, we're comparing everything they do to Horizon. I don't mean to plug you too much shamelessly, Greg. I'm not getting any kind of kickback, but I just know oh, from stop, so stop, Mackenzie, stop. Yes, right. <laughs> Mackenzie and Nicole. Nicole is a fund manager and, and Mackenzie does a lot of the paperwork. Of Many of you people have, have interacted with, with her. And she, I just know she with certain uh, IRAs that she works with, self-directed companies, she kind of goes, oh no. Well, but some, some of them take weeks. I mean, we yeah. are still in the process of trying to help people invest with us. Um, and we're on week three or four of just trying to communicate with these other custodians. Um, whereas Horizon, it's just, it's like I said earlier, it's a streamlined yeah. process. We know exactly what one document is necessary for our lenders. And um, it just, it's, yeah. Mackenzie's always well, like, well, oh, good. We're with Horizon. <laughs> I'll give it back to you for a second. I, I mean, when you, the power of that weeks, I mean, you can give me the example here, Nicole and, and Rob, but uh, weeks, I mean, if, if they were in one of your deals a month longer than going through the paperwork, that's, you know, a thousand dollars more in interest, right? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. 
some people sometimes are trying to like save. It's funny because we aren't the cheapest. We're not the most expensive. We're, you know, a little bit right in the middle, maybe on the upper end, but they're like, oh, I'm going to save $200. We just lost a thousand. But I will say also, because we've seen thousands of investments, uh, it is always kind of a nice peace of mind when we, you know, and I see a client working with you guys, uh, I've only gotten great results. You know, people are telling me, have you heard of Rob and Nicole? I'm like, yes, I've heard of them. And so they it goes back to you guys as well. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And so I would say, I don't know, uh, D- David and Dorothy, I saw them on here. Um, the and then Katie, uh, yeah, the shares, a few other folks have been out. So we have projects in Atlanta, San Antonio and Colorado Springs. We'll have people actually go to those sites to, to visit. I'm, we're going out to, so I'm in Hawaii. So I fly from Hawaii to Georgia on Sunday night. Um, not directly stop in LA and then, and then on, but so we'll have people come out to our projects and look at them. Uh, and we, we love that and encourage that just, uh, if anybody ever wants to see ours. So speaking about self-directed IRAs, I mean, to me, it's money that you've got parked there for future. It seems like, a, why wouldn't you invest it in something other than what the, I mean, I don't, I'm not a huge believer in the stock market, right? Because I don't control any of what happens there. But uh, as far as uh, self-directed IRAs, it's a, to me, it's a no-brainer. Invest in what you know and what you trust. Um, if you're a physician, you know, I know physicians invest in medical buildings because they know the people moving into them, they can hold them. I know, you know, other people will invest in that, the, the power of a self-directed IRA. IRA. Well, I, I'd yeah. like them to talk about one of the deals because I'm sure there's, you know, we got 200, over 200 people on here and I'm sure there's some people here yeah. just saying, all right, so yeah, I, I, I want to do this self-directed IRA thing, but I need a deal. Right. Like, I don't want to just roll the money into a self-directed IRA and have that money sit in a, a cash mm-hmm. account. I need to move that money. I need to make a return. Rob, what do you got, man? What do you got? <laughs> or Nicole, so, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, that's no, right. Well, actually, sorry, Rob, step aside. Nicole, <laughs> what do you got for these nights? It says my name on the bottom. That's my fault. I should have said Nicole. <laughs> no. Okay. So <laughs> like him she's, a, she's a little more gun shy. I'm, I'm an introvert. These are not my <laughs> most comfortable um, realm. But anybody who knows and talks with her one-on-one knows that she's, she's definitely great one-on-one. So as far as deals go, we have a bunch of projects. We've got Columbus. Many of you were investing in Covington. We're moving that forward. We've got first lien positions. We've got our funds, uh, our fund that we're rolling forward with. And that just gives us a little more flexibility, but we've got a- It also allows people to diversify in what they're invested in, multiple projects as opposed to one single project. Right. So we've got a hundred unit townhome deal that closes in a couple of weeks called Columbus Creek. Sometimes we call it River Road. That one, townhome build the rent. We will hang on to that one for long-term rents. At completion, we'll have like 25% equity in that deal. We've got Leland Drive, which we've spoken to some folks about. We're A lot of times, just to give you some sort of heads up, we'll put a project under contract with the closing date tied to a permit for actually when we can move dirt. And the reason we do that is so that we don't end up closing on it and then we can't get a permit later. So like a couple of these have permits coming up. Columbus, we actually started the dirt work for, so we know that one's closing. Leland, we're still, it's kind of still in limbo because we don't have the permit yet, but it should be coming within the next month to six weeks. It could come tomorrow. Once we have that, then we have a timeline to, to raise for. So we've always got projects. You mentioned the Marlboro deal. I mean, that that project we bought for just under $20 million, it'll take 15 years, right? That's a long project. But when, as we're building it out, that'll return just the lot sales, just the dirt before we put in roads, $600 million worth of revenue. So that kind of gives you guys, we'll we'll take it through an annexation and rezoning, entitlement. These are all benchmarks that bring it into the city, then give it zoning so we can build homes or commercial or industrial. And that many, it's over 10,000 doors. So that one's going to take a long time. The, a lot of these proceeds will, will get, get returned back to investors and things. It doesn't take selling the entire community to return funds, which is nice, right? In that kind of case, it sells, you sell just a small uh, portion of it, but we've got a bunch of projects that we're working on. We'll probably, and I don't want to do, be too scary here when I say this number, but we'll probably raise 75 to $100 million from private investors in the next 12 months. So that seems like a really big number, and it is, but we thrive off the investors that are investing 100000 at a time. Mm-hmm. So uh, we appreciate those that come from Horizon and, uh, and all of Chris, uh, Chris's people that he refers our way as well. Yeah. And the reason I wanted you guys to come on for a short bit where I pulled you off that beautiful sunny beach where you guys were basking in the sun and having fun is because literally like all the folks on here, I just feel like they deserve to have an option like this. This isn't folks. I want to be clear about something like 
being able to lend money to you know a couple like this, a company like their company, ROI Properties, you don't have that option. I don't care if you're a multimillionaire or you're you know you're a, a normal middle class or not, yeah middle class. I almost said middle age person, middle class. Like most people, <laughs> who's talking not, to me? Yeah, I'm, I'm middle age. Most people do not have the ability to have opportunities like this to invest in giant development deals and also to lend money to somebody that doesn't need your money. Think about that real quick. Like, who do you want to lend money to? You want to lend it to somebody that like has no money and they can only do the deal if you give them the money and, and you're at full risk? Or do you want to lend to somebody like them who have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate? Literally, like, I'm not saying they don't need your money because they're scaling, but they really don't need your money. They can go to the bank and the bank will give them all the money that they want. They can find institutional lenders that will give them all the money they want. They could just go to Greg and say, screw all you guys. I'm, Greg will just fund all my deals because why wouldn't he? Greg, you got, you got $75 million dollars that sounds like a pretty good deal yeah, i wish i had 75 um, cash yes right. well i mean here's the reality of it chris this is what ends up happening people don't convert to a self-directed ira they give it to a financial advisor who puts some of it with blackstone and, and fortress and blah 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 they get a five percent return and then fortress or blackstone invests with us, with us and gets a 12 percent return they keep a seven point spread and return five percent to their investors except for the years that they lose 20 percent and then you know, so they, they give all that away. They, they're they like, oh, the sorry, we can't control loss. that. Yeah. Uh, and so, but I mean, anyway. that's, that's one of the reasons that we love working with individuals is because they can't always find these, these opportunities anywhere else. Um, they're, you know, just like he said, you know, we don't want to be paying the Blackstones and the, you know, the people who already have millions and millions and millions of dollars. We get to work with, um, small business owners. We get to work with retired police officers and university professors and, um, stay at home moms who are the ones who are managing the finances for their families. Mm -hmm. And we just, we get to work with incredible individuals and actually help them be more set up for the future, for their family, for the next generation. And that brings us a lot of joy. That brings us a lot of satisfaction in what we do. And, and, and that's why we like doing it. We love working with private individuals, private lenders. And I think folks, you know, just to, just to kind of keep it rolling, like if any of you want to set up a call with Nicole, you're, you're still doing the calls, right, Nicole? Yeah. And they get yeah. back. People like her better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know Rob, they, they like Nicole better. I mean, did you see all the people like, you know, saying how much they love Nicole? And I didn't I know. see anybody. You're say, a rock star, Nicole. Love, yeah. We love it. No, They're really hammering it home. I got it. <laughs> They're both great. But if you guys want to set up a call, uh, you know, give them a few days to enjoy paradise and then uh, send me an email. I put my contact right there. It's contact at chrisnoggle.com, not a hard one to remember. And then what I'll do is I'll just, I'll, I'll set up either a text or an email and you guys can then set up a Zoom and have discussions about all their deals. It's not just the Marlboro deal. They got all, all bunch of deals. You know, it's, it's a hundred thousand minimum. So I just want to be clear about that. So it's a hundred thousand minimum and it's 12%. And then they've got a bunch of different options you know, if you got more money you want to do, then there's a, a tier system and, and 15 is the highest, I believe. 15%. Yeah. So you can get up. Yeah, to that's right. Yeah. So when you're looking at deals and you're looking at really solid deals, folks, this is one, and I don't mean to, you know, toot the horn, but it's worth tooting. Trust me and ask anybody on here that's lending to them. They'll say the same thing. So I just wanted to bring you guys out of the sun because I know you're getting a little red, Rob, like a little sunscreen, like put it right on the tip of that the was, nose. That was after 40 minutes, by the way, because I've been <laughs> working most just of the day. Came outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to cut you loose so you can get out there and please stop working. Go enjoy paradise. And thank you both for coming on. And, you know, hey, hopefully you enjoy you your time. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys Thanks soon. Appreciate us. it. Good you're welcome. Good you guys. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. Folks, and, you know, this was just a special guest we brought on and I just felt like we really owed it. I mean, there's over 200 of you and we just want to give you the option to have access to people like that, that we have access to, whether you're part of private money club or not, like you now have access to set up a call with them. But the other thing too, back to what we we're talking about, Greg, is self-directed IRAs provide the mechanism to do something like that. You can't lend money to Rob and Nicole on their Marlboro deal. If you got a traditional 401k, a traditional self-directed IRA, you got to have 
the ability and the custodian that allows it to do. And that's what your company does. One thing I was going to add to that, Chris, is, is, you know, we at Horizon Trust, we're not fiduciaries. I don't, you know, pitch investments in, in, but we are the vehicle that helps you use qualified monies, retirement monies to invest in what you want. I just want to make sure that's clear. But I think that's how we also teamed up, Chris, because you came to me and said, hey, look, I got this private money club and I've got I've got investors that want to invest and they want to use the retirement monies. And so that's that's kind of how we got together, just so everyone kind of gets, you know, how this all works together is Chris said, hey, can you come on and talk about it? So when people want to use Private Money Club, which is a great place to go find different alternative assets, they can use the retirement funds for that. So that's why it works so well together. And we have a lot of Private Money Club investors uh, and account holders at Horizon Trust Company that's worked really, really well. Because that is one of the first questions they ask, like, man, this sounds great. I love your Dave Ramsey calculator, just the calculator part. Um, and, uh, you know, how do I make, the, this all sounds good, but how do I make 12%, Greg? I'm like, well, that's not, that's not my expertise. I mean, it is for my own personal money, um, but it is what the private money club does and, and, and they educate you on that. So that's why it's been so good. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and folks, you know, like private money club, all of you can go there. You can all create a profile. It's, it's free to create a profile and browse it. If you actually want to lend or borrow, it is a, a membership site. Uh, we've got a really cool special, not that I'm going to use this time to talk about it, but we, we did a bundle. It's the Accelerator eight-week eight week coaching program bundled with the Private Money Club. We've got a discount on that. I'll post that up in a little bit. But if you guys are kind of like, all right, I want to get into Private Money Club, but I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to work it. I don't know how to lend. I don't know how to do the, the paperwork. Then just do the bundle. Just do the eight-week coaching along with Private Money Club. It gives you the best of both worlds. You get someone... a, a personal coach that's going to walk you through it, teach you what to do, whether you're a lender or a borrower or both. And it's just going to get it done. And, you know, we came up with the accelerator program because all of you asked for it. People are in private money club being like, I need somebody to hold my hand. I need somebody to help me. I need, I need somebody to like walk me through how to do this. And we're like, well, darn, like, okay, well, let's provide that. And we did. And then we bundle, you know, Greg and Horizon Trust into that. So now if you've got qualified money just sitting out there in left field, an old 401k, an IRA that's not doing anything, actually, it is doing something. All of your IRAs are doing something, and it's called losing money right now. And I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but it's the reality. And if you think, like, damage is already done, the markets are going to continue to go lower and lower. The Fed will continue to keep raising interest rates higher and higher. Inflation just went up again, folks. The markets are going to go down much further. You got to you got to get your money in your control in a place where you can do things where no matter what the market does, they are not correlated. Robin, Robin, Nicole's deals are not correlated to what the stock market's doing. When the stock market drops like 700 points or wherever it finished today. Um, oh, none of you knew it dropped that far. Yeah. Just go to CNBC. You'll see it. Their deal doesn't stop. Their checks don't change. Oh, hey, guys. I know you lent money to, to us on that Marlboro deal, but the market dropped 700 points. We're going to have to pay you less. It doesn't work that way. They pay you the same amount. It's a state of return. Like you can't get that kind of stuff anywhere else. And so, so does private money club. So this training really is for that. But the other thing too, is a lot of you, you know, have some great questions. I mean, questions about annuities. So we, it's seven o'clock, Greg, should we kind of tackle some of the 16 open questions or yeah, I, I, I do have a, 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 my son's basketball practice. I got to go in 10 minutes. So I got 10 minutes. Let's try to, let's try right. to and, and, and before that, by the way, if anyone, I, I think you've seen, I had uh, Brandy and uh, Claudia on this giving out their emails. And so if you set up a call or email and say, Hey, I want to do a strategy session with us. We'll do that and answer your specific questions for your account. So if we don't get to your question, just do a quick, uh, send us a quick email. We'll get back to you. You can email me, Greg Herlean at Horizon Trust, and we'll respond to all your questions within 24 hours. So, and Brandy's on there, looks like too. So yeah, let's, let's tackle some of these questions before I got a, I got a kind of a hard stop in like 10 minutes. That's fine, Greg. I'll, I'll pick up any questions, you know, that I, 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 can, I can do a lot of these. So folks, we're going to cherry pick the questions right now because I'm going to answer a lot of them after that. Uh, first one. So uh, Madeline said, can a trust own a self-directed IRA? No, it's an individual that would own a self-directed IRA. Okay. Uh, James said, within my self-directed Roth IRA, I have an LLC that is used to buy and hold rental properties. With the LLC, am I able to apply for business credit, credit cards, et cetera, of course, to expand the business? Most likely, Yes. So long as you personally are not a guarantor or liable for any deficiencies, 
which I think is the kicker. Most credit cards are not going to lend the business, especially a new business, without your social security number tied to it. So that probably won't work unless you just need to make sure that that LLC does not have any personal um, liability. You have no personal liability with it. But what I will say in our website, you can find this and is you can borrow money, a non-recourse money to buy real estate and rental properties. And so um, if you're, if you, let's say you find a $200,000 property and your IRA only has a hundred thousand, we have lenders that will lend the other half non-recourse. So you aren't personally liable for it, which makes it, you know, allowable. Basically you can do that. And so it's not prohibited. Um, so we can help you with that. So Evelyn said, um, and I think she's referring to the self-directed IRAs. What about annuities? Can you own an annuity inside of a self-directed IRA? I mean, first off, you should, you never should, but I guess, can you? I don't, I, and I apologize, don't know the answer, but no one comes to us and moves their money and then goes to an annuity. So I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah. So maybe, but it's, there's no reason to. If you plan on going to annuity, you can just do it directly into an annuity from where you're at. Correct. Yeah, I, I don't know why anyone would ever buy an annuity inside of a self-directed. You're, you're, you're taking that control and then you're, you're getting it back and then you're going like, oh my God, hot potato, I can't do this. And you give it back to the insurance company and the annuity. I, that would just not be a smart move. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is a good one. Matthew, uh, thanks for joining us, Matt. Uh, please discuss owning LLCs in the IRA. Great question. So your, and in, in, uh, if this gets too technical, I'm sorry, but so your IRA can invest in different asset classes, including LLCs or, you know, or your business. Now you get there's a little bit trickery. It's a little trickery if you are investing in your own business. It can't be a your own business that you currently have open. That would be prohibited. You cannot do that. But if you want to open up in the example someone already gave in the previous question, let's say that you want an LLC to be um, owned by your IRA, you can do that. Your IRA can actually own a brand new LLC and that LLC, can have passive real estate investments in there or a passive business uh, could be in there. Like for example, uh, you could buy a tattoo parlor with that LLC that's owned by your IRA. The important part about this is you can't take any personal distributions from your LLC. So you can't pay yourself a realtor commission. You can't pay yourself a, a management fee. Um, that would blow up um, or, or, or you know, make it so you've got to pay penalties and taxes on your retirement account. So uh, again, if I'm not answering your question, we should definitely do a call. But you can have your IRA, Roth, a traditional or simple self-directed account. It can own an LLC. But if like, for example, I have... Greg Herleen Real Estate LLC, and I've been doing all this real estate in there. I can't now from scratch have it buy interest into that LLC, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So Todd has, has a question. Todd was on Wealth Webinar and, and he asked the question. So his question is to you, Greg, specifically. He says, in regards to Chris's response to my answer on last week's Wealth Webinar in relation to trust, Question, Greg, if I sold my IBC policy to a non-grantor, irrevocable, complex, discretionary spendthrift trust, <laughs> be a safe and great way to protect and magnify the benefits of my IBC policy by eliminating the MEC limit using the tax-deferred money in the trust, or you, you want me to just answer this one, Greg? I know it's- uh, Yeah, you, but yes. Yes. Okay, I, Todd, I, I'm going to take that one, but that might be the very last question because it's very deep and, and it has nothing to do with Greg and self-directed IRAs because you're not going to have a self-directed IRA owned by any of the trusts or doing anything with there. Well, before you answer that question, Chris, there is a question here about the non-recourse loan I think I should tackle. It says, will your non-recourse loan and self-directed IRA, do you need to pay taxes on the proceeds attributed to the non-recourse portion? Sandy, that's awesome. You're absolutely accurate. And so when we talk about non-recourse, uh, that, that is something that uh, when you borrow money, let's say that you did that $100,000 from your IRA and $100,000 from a non-recourse loan, when you sell that asset, um, a certain percentage of that, basically 50% of the proceeds, you will have to pay a tribute, some tax and pay taxes on. Um, but if you do the math, it absolutely makes sense because the other half, you're not paying taxes on. Uh, and it enables you to actually really maximize the return. So um, it's called UBIT taxes, and that's something that uh, you definitely need to be aware of. Um, but it's almost always is worthwhile. So, so good, good question. 
Very good. Uh, let's see, Derek, uh, currently have an annuity, would like to take 10%. I want you to answer that crazy question. I don't even know. That, that was- uh, I know exactly what he's talking about. Okay. He, he went uh, we a little don't... too far with explaining the, like the trust, well, just a may, complex- maybe not, maybe not now, but but I do I I'll do. I'll explain that. It's, he's basically got a similar trust structure to what I have, what Brent has, what Devin has, what Joseph has. It's, it's just a complex trust structure that goes to a foundation. We got our own 501c3. And because of that, you can own the- the policies within the corpus of the trust and the MEC rules don't apply because it's it's, it's within it. the, the corpus, you know, of a federal okay. trust. Okay. So he just called it something really crazy, but you know, I you know, I'll talk to Todd and we'll we'll get to the bottom of the next thing okay. he's talking right. about. But it, that's like out of everybody on here, you know, well, it was 200 until I started reading Todd's question. Out of all oh. of them, <laughs> that might apply to half of one percent of all the people on here. Right. Uh, but we will hit it because why not? Uh, Derek said currently have an annuity. Uh, I would take at least a 10% hit if I close it early. Would this be a reasonable way to start up a self-directed IRA? So he's thinking he has to close his annuity to start up a self-directed IRA. That's not the case. You could just roll your proceeds from your annuity into the self-directed IRA. Greg, I don't know if you want to comment on, on that. Yeah, I mean, you can roll it over, but but what he might be talking about is his annuity might have some penalties to leaving. Surrender it, that's all. So, so, so if your annuity has some surrender penalties, um, that could apply. But I would, I, you know, the, the answer is for you to make that decision if you should take that penalty or not. And typically that's based upon pulling out my hgccalculator.com thing and talk and, and put in there basically right now, like, okay, if I have $100,000 in for the next whatever 10 years, I'm going to make, what are you making in your annuity? 5%, 6%. And so if you're, if you're going to do that, make 6% for the next 10 years, what does that look like? Or if I have a hundred thousand dollars and I'm going to take a 10% penalty, I don't know, 5% penalty. So basically your hundred thousand rolls over to a self-directed account. So your hundred goes to 90 or 95. And now you think you're going to make eight or 9% over 10 years. You know, what does that look like? And most likely it pencils to do it, but you can make that decision based upon what you're going to invest in. So, yeah. Uh, James said, can you move from a, an employer 401k to a self-directed IRA while I'm still working at that employer? You cannot. You, you, you have to have exited either left or, or been let go. How do you combine IFB, SD, IRA, and PMC? What is, what is IFB? Do you know, Greg? I think, he, I think they're probably talking about infant banking concept. Maybe it's a maybe. A oh, oh, yeah. IBC, self-directed yeah. IRA, and, and yeah. Really, you don't combine IBC and the self-directed, but they're both being your own bank because you're controlling the funds. And then you just go on pri privatemoneyclub.com and you just find a deal you like. I mean, I'm really salivating over this 20% banger ROI, and I'm not even talking about it because I'm I, I kind of want to check it out myself. I mean, I got 39 grand in my self-directed IRA, and I got definitely 39 grand in my IBC policy. So uh, we'll get back on that one. <laughs> but uh, all you would do is you would just use the funds and you would lend it through private money club on deals that you like deals that you underwrite deals that fit your needs and goals. Yeah. Um, that would be the best way I think I could answer that. If you want to frame the question a different way, I'll, I'll give it a shot a different uh, in a different capacity. But Chris, Greg, I I know, you, Chris, I'm going to jump. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. I know you're, you're cutting time. So what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to continue going through this. And I got a couple other examples I want to talk about with uh, my wife's self-directed IRA and how we use hers. So I wanted to kind of do that before we wrap tonight, Greg, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We're here to serve and educate and whatever you need, we're here. So thank you so much. You're Thanks welcome. For having me, Chris. No, not a problem. So Brandy, if you're on, uh, stay, you know, stay with me because I might kick some questions over to you. All right. So folks, let's get the rest of these questions out of the way. How do the fees and self-directed compare to the fees of mainstream retirement accounts? Very similar. So Doug, it really depends. Like Greg's accounts, like the max fee is 1%. But see, here's the cool thing. It's 1% of assets that you have in there or money that you have in there. And then as your account goes up, it's like as you get a higher and higher balance, that percentage goes down. It's a fixed percentage. And that includes everything. There's no nickel and diming. There's no extra add-on cost. That's how Greg did it. And that's what makes Horizon Trust very different is it is just a flat fee. Most companies might have a lower like set fee, but then they nickel and dime you for every transaction. I know this because Horizon used to do that. I would do a lending deal and it just feel, felt like it was a cost for this. It was a cost for this. It was a cost for this. Now, how they do it is just one flat with a max of 1%. 
and, and Brandy, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think that's it. And then it just graduates down as the balance in your account goes up. So that's how the fees work. So if you compare that to a traditional mainstream retirement account, I can tell you right now, most of the funds within 401ks exceed one and a half percent. Actually, some of them, like those target dates and those freedom dates, they can be closer to 2% in terms of fees. And that doesn't even include all of the other ancillary costs, like the wrap fees, if you got a wrap 401k plan. If you got a traditional IRA, um, out, outside of maybe a TD or a Schwab that you're kind of doing it, because those fees are pretty low, then you're just paying the fees on whatever you invest in. If you use Vanguard funds, it could be half a percent, 20 basis points. Um, but if you got a a, a brokerage account with an advisor, I, I don't know any advisors right now charging less than 1%. Most of them are more like one, one and a half, you know, one, two, five. I know I used to charge 1.25 for stock accounts and I would charge 1% for, you know, all bond accounts because they required less management. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, we already hit Matthew's question about discussing owning an LLC and an IRA. Jesus has said, let's see, question about life insurance banks versus normal banks that loan out money to the general population because of the rumors of the global leaders controlling money, freezing accounts, communists, and <laughs> printing all the money they want, which they, printing all the money they want is nothing new. Is this risk where to, were to happen in the United States? How would life insurance money be protected versus the money in normal banks? So when you're saying life insurance and banks, like, you know, I often say like start your own banking system, but I'm not saying that the policy is a bank. Like it's not, the policy is especially designed and engineered whole life. So I just wanna be clear about that. You know, we just, we just help you build a banking system to take back the banking functions in your life. The infinite banking concept is what that is. So I, I just wanna be clear, a normal bank is a normal bank. You're still gonna use one in conjunction with your, your policy and not the infinite banking concept because you need to run your money through a traditional bank first and then that money then goes into the policy of which there you can then deploy that money to deals on private money club, the Fuller's deals, whatever, and then recycle and recapture the money on the back end. So very different. But I think you're asking, where's the risk? Insurance policies, by the sheer nature, whole life, we'll just talk about, but all insurance policies, permanent insurance, they are private, which means you don't need to report them. They don't show up on, the, on, on any radar screens except for the insurance companies. And it's the reason why you don't know how much money the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, or any of the wealthiest individuals have because their money's private. And that's what this is. So that right there should make you feel warm. Plus they're protected against judgments and liens in most states. That should also add a second level of protection for you. Um, banks, I, I always call banks low hanging fruit. You get sued, they're going after your bank account. They are, that, that's where they're gonna go. They're gonna, get, they're gonna seize your bank records and they're gonna subpoena it and that's it. They're not going to go after your life insurance because it's protected in most states, you know, barring maybe one or a couple of the states that it's not, but it's still far more protected than the banks. So I guess it's just the lesser of the two, right? Uh, there's no true way to protect everything, but the life policy, the whole life policy is certainly one of the best bets you've got in this country since there's no longer insurance for people's money in banks. You got that right. I mean, if anyone believes in the FDIC and actually thinks that's got all the money that they need to bail everybody out if the banking systems fail, think again. They'll just print more money until the US dollar is no longer the dollar. Uh, can you give us ideal what to do with your money in your life scenarios? Not sure, Unanimous, what you mean by that, but you know, all sorts of options on Private Money Club. I'll just do a flash up of it again. So here's Private Money Club. You can go to browse deals and you can look through all sorts of deals. And pretty soon, Private Money Club's gonna expand. You're gonna be able to do alternative options, things like, you know, there's companies that buy forklifts and scissor lifts and all that. You can, you can actually buy the lift. They will refurbish it, like use lifts, refurbish it. So think of flipping houses, but imagine flipping equipment. We got a company that does that. Their average returns are about 30% in about a, a 90 to 120 day time frame. And after 120 days, they got a money back guarantee. So if you buy a lift and they can't sell it after it's refurbished, they'll just give you your money back. But that's another option coming to private money club. So there's all sorts of options on things you can do. You know, anonymous, I don't even know your name. So I have no idea what your risk tolerances are, what your risk and reward profiles are. I have no idea what your needs and goals are. So I could never tell you what to do, nor can Horizon. But you can go through and look at the menu, if you will, and see different things that fit your fancy and things that you like. Maybe you like this 20% banger uh, first lien position deal that's $39,000 they're looking to raise. I, I don't know. But all sorts of options. Hopefully that helps a little bit. 
Uh, Deborah said, I'm with Todd on the same question with the Spendthrift Trust and using IBC policies as a MEC policy. I will hit that. Liam, how can you move your pension to a self-directed IRA? So Liam, if you're no longer, if you've severed ties with that employer that offered the pension, you should be able to just roll that over. Some pensions have vesting schedules and other things you'd have to check with the company where the pension is. But if you're still working there, then no bueno. There's no way to move that money from your existing employer to a self-directed while you're still working there. That's just that's just offline or off limits, I should say. At a company with a 403B with a 4% match, would it be reasonable to contribute a high percentage, eight to 15% strictly for the opportunities to take loans and benefit from the reduction in taxable income? How are you benefiting from the reduction in, oh, you mean from the contributions to the 403B? I mean, I guess if that's what you wanna do, because you can, but just remember, Liam, you can only let, the only amount of loan you can take from your 403B or 401k is 50,000 or 50%. The, the, whatever's great, you know, the, the, whatever one's greater, 50,000 or 50% is the max you can take. Um, so if that's all you need, great. I guess your strategy could work. I would never do that. Uh, if I had a qualified retirement plan, like, like Liam does, and they match 4%. Guess, can anyone guess how much money I'm putting in? Can anyone guess how much money I'm putting in if I've got a match of 4%? 4%. There you go. Thank you, folks. So there, there's your answer. I'm gonna, if I got a match of 4, I'm putting in 4. That's it. No more, no less. Uh, let's see. Uni, are the IBC whole life protected from aliens and court settlements in California? Yes, I believe California. I'd have to double check. Well, you can Google it yourself. Uh, I believe California is one of the protect uh, the states where it's protected against judgments and liens. But again, I'd have to look that up. I don't memorize all the states. If anyone knows if California is one of the protected states, please comment. But I'm pretty sure it is. I think I remember answering that before. Uh, let's see, protected from tax liens and court settlements in California. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure it is. Again, Google's a great resource. That's what I would do. I would go to Google and just say, you know, is California, is life insurance in California protected against liens and judgments? All right, Liam. Also, a question on IBC. Could you take loans out of an IBC? So when you say IBC, you're referring to a whole life insurance policy designed and engineered specifically to work for the infinite banking concept. So I'm just trying to quantify that a little bit. So because a lot of people just say IBC, but a lot of people then think IBC is the whole life policy. It is not. IBC, the infinite banking concept founded by the late R. Nelson Nash, is a process, a process of taking back the banking functions in your life. The whole life insurance policy is designed and engineered to work within the infinite banking concept process as a more efficient place to run your money through. So just want to be clear on that and invest. So yeah, you would never take loans from an IBC from your IBC system, banking system from the whole life policy and invest into an IRA. You just never would do that. It's just counterproductive. You're taking money out of a a non-qualified account, an account that has no real restrictions, and you're putting it into an IRA, even a self-directed IRA, and now you've got the restrictions that come along with a qualified retirement plan. You can't take the money out before 59 and a half without IRS penalties and without taxation, unless it's a Roth, then it's tax-free. You got all these rules over here in non-qualified world, which is the policy and using it for your banking system, no real rules like that. So it's a good question. I get that a lot, Liam, but yeah, just, just cross that right out of your mind. You would never want to do that. You'd be better off just taking the money that's qualified money, retirement money, putting it into a self-directed IRA. Take your non-qualified money, your savings money, put that into the policy, and then use the infinite banking concept and learn the infinite banking concept. Hopefully that answers that question. Uh, Rob, intrigued by what you do with your, oh yeah, thank you. I had so many questions I want to get through them. So this is my wife's self-directed IRA. It's not a big account. She worked at, uh, I don't remember what bank this was, I think m and Bank. And you know, we knew Greg back in 2014. She, she didn't work at the bank anymore because she, she had left the bank, truly left the bank. Her father said he was going to disown her because he was the manager of her at that bank. And she then went independent. And me and her, that's where we started our real estate company and started flipping houses. So when she did that, she rolled her self, her IRA or her 401k from the bank into a self-directed IRA. So ever since she did that, we've just been lending her money out. She's got about 30 some thousand bucks in there now. I think she started with about 20 and we've grown it about 10 grand. This is just a simple deal. Uh, 720 Birch Street, it's, it's a, a, a borrower through Private Money Club. And she lent him 25,000 bucks. 
at 12%. She's making 250 bucks a month. And how we do these deals, and, and this is all part of the eight week accelerator training. So I'll put that up for you here real quick. Let me just put the, if any of you are interested in Private Money Club, this is where you're gonna go because this is the best bang for your buck. It's privatemoneyclub.com forward slash accelerator. It's an eight week coaching, whether you're a lender or a borrower, you get to pick and choose which one you are. And then once you do that, there's a bundled program and then you're gonna get Private Money Club. So you'll have access to Private Money Club, but we teach you all of this over eight weeks and they teach you, you know, how to have confidence, credibility, clarity, and, and it's all broken down. Every single week, what you're gonna get, what they're gonna cover is all right there. So I put that link in the chat. If any of you are interested, we got a bunch of you already in the program using it. It's, it's a game changer. And then you get Private Money Club, but you'd find deals like this. And then the, the coaching program also teaches you how to structure a properly done note. This is a note. Okay, which spells out the terms of the agreement. And then also part of the note is gonna be a mortgage, which right here. So then there's a mortgage, which is the security instrument. And both of these the note and the mortgage, just like your primary note and mortgage are recorded at the courthouse. So now this is a lien on this property. So if he doesn't pay her, this property becomes hers. And this property is worth far more than $25,000, way, way more. So that's it, she's getting paid. She's secured by the mortgage in the note, okay, the promissory note. These are recorded. So she's in a lien position, first lien. And this is what we've done with my wife's self-directed IRA. There's nothing complicated about it. I know it's different than calling your advisor and buying a stock, but really it's not. It's no different. Instead of you know getting a stock certificate, you get a note. And stocks don't come with security like the mortgage. So that's how that's how we do that. That I've been doing this for my wife and helping her do it. She understands it, but she's busy doing what she does. She designs houses and works with other flippers and other developers designing their projects and she's pretty stressed out doing that. But that's that's how we've used her. So what I just showed you, that's pretty much all that it takes to get into this game. You know, a lot of people fear the self-directed part because they don't know how to, but you didn't know how to ride a bike before you learned how to ride a bike. And then you did, and then off you went. So that was my wife's example. So let's just see, do you have any mastermind meetings in the near future? Sure do. Our next mastermind, Liam, is gonna be in Las Vegas. The Mexico one that we go on in April is totally sold out. So the next one will be in Las Vegas. It's gonna be our mastermind. I'll, I'll be sharing the link very soon. So it'll be on my website. It'll be on Private Money Club's events tab uh, in the menu. And it'll also be advertised by us. And that'll be in Las Vegas. We're staying at the Virgin Hotel, which is the old hard rock. And we're going to be racing Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis. What else do we have on there? All sorts of fun cars. We're, we're, we're renting a place out that has all these cars. And we're just going to race seven laps. We're going, to, we're going to drive really fast sports cars, like not just sports cars, exotics. And that's going to be one of the features. So you can join us and we can talk business. And guess where I met Rob Fuller? I met him at that same racetrack. The difference at that one was I got to drive the Ferrari. He was right after me and it started raining, so he didn't get to drive. So that's the story. But yes, you can join us at those masterminds. I know we're getting kind of to the end. I want to make sure I hit uh, Todd's question and Deborah's question. So Deborah and Todd, my guess is Deborah and Todd, and, and Todd and Deborah, you guys can be open and honest. You work for a company that does this. Am I correct? And I think I know the company because I, I know I'm pretty sure Deborah works with this company. Can you in the chat let me know that you work for a company? Because a lot of times when I get detailed questions like this, it's because they're trying to, you know, basically kind of talk about the company that they work for. Am I correct in thinking that, Deborah and Todd? Do you, you work with a company that sets these structures up? And it's okay if you do. Hey, listen, all the kudos to you if you do. But it just solidifies why you would ask like a question like that. Anyway, but his, his question, you know, to, to, to me and to Greg was, if I sold my IBC policy to a non-grantor irrevocable, irrevocable, complex, discretionary, spendthrift trust be a safe and great way to protect and magnify the benefits of my IBC policy by eliminating the MEC limit. So let me explain the MEC limit. So the IRS has rules when it comes to life insurance. If you want your policy to not be taxed as an investment, it has to fit the IRS MEC 7 pay rule, which basically is a test that they do. The amount of money going into the policy in premium deposits and the amount of death benefit must be within these certain ranges. So if you wanted to put a million dollars into the policy, you gotta have a certain amount of death benefit to support those premiums. That's, that's what they do. And if you do uh, qualify based on the MEC 7 pay, 
now your policy is tax free. So what Todd and Deborah are saying is if you if you were to have the trust be the owner, the trust doesn't have to buy. I mean, he, he said, if I sold my IBC policy, which you're really not, you're just changing ownership of the policy to the trust or opening a, a policy within the corpus of the trust, as long as the trust is set up properly, typically a complex trust structure inside the corpus of the trust, the MEC rules don't matter. So you could essentially do, if you could find a mutually owned insurance company that did a single premium policy, you could just dump a million bucks into a policy one time and it would be a MEC from day one outside of the trust, but inside the trust it is not. And it still maintains that tax-free status. So you could, or you could do any policy that we design, you could have the trust be the owner and not have to worry about the MEC rules. So that's the first thing. Uh, let's see. And would that be a good way to protect and magnify the benefits of an IBC policy by eliminating the, the MAC limit? Yes, if it's applicable for the client's needs and goals. That is not applicable for a lot of people's needs and goals because a lot of people don't need a complex trust structure. If you're not paying, I'm going to be honest, if you're not paying over $100,000 in federal income tax per year with the anticipation of continuing to pay over $100,000 in federal income tax per year, I think you'd be a fool. And I'm just being honest, and, and Todd and Deborah would probably disagree. I think you'd be a fool to set up a complex trust structure, to spend the money to do it, because it's very expensive. I, I mean, I don't know what their company charges, but anywhere between probably 20 and I paid 95,000. I'll just be transparent. Through Solomon at Wealth Builders Group, my complex trust structure and my foundation, the whole structure set up, but they do everything. They restructure all my operating agreements. There's way more to it. That was 95 grand. Others might be less, but I just went with somebody I trusted and that I knew. So if it was the right thing for somebody, sure, it would make sense. But understand one thing. In this complex, irrevocable trust structure that Todd's talking about, it is exactly that. It's irrevocable. Meaning, once you put the policy in it, yes, you don't have to worry about MEC rules, but that policy can't come out of it, which is great for protection because you don't own the policy anymore. So regardless of if you get sued or someone comes after you, they can't take anything within the policy. And normally they can't either if it's a protected state, because remember it's protected against judgments and liens in most states. Um, the, the main reason to do that structure would be for tax reasons. And there's lots of tax reasons to do this kind of structure. If, you, if you're in a high income tax bracket and you're paying a lot in taxes, this will help you. No ifs, ands, or buts. You gotta follow the rules. There's a lot of rules behind it uh, because it's definitely targeted by the IRS. And you know there's a good chance that if somebody does something wrong, you're gonna get popped. But it, it, I will agree, it is a good way to protect and magnify the benefits of your IBC policy by eliminating the MAC using tax deferred money. So what he's talking about is using tax deferred money, which all policies are tax deferred in the trust as an expense. So he's talking about now you can get tax write-offs because now when the policy is funded by the trust, the trust can use those, those premiums as a tax write-off, as an expense. You can't do that outside of the trust. The premiums that go in are after tax dollars. Inside the, the trust, you actually could use tax deductible dollars, essentially expense dollars for those premiums. So there's an added tax advantage for doing that. Uh, let's see. And also bonus of tax deferring. Yeah, so what they're saying is if your trust, mine is a business trust in this capacity that would own my policy, your family trust can own a policy as well, but business trust typically, your policy and your trust, but the policy is the machine, like the, the engine, you could buy, you could lend money to Rob Fuller, or you could buy a piece, let's use a piece of real estate. Let's say you buy a piece of real estate inside your business trust, and then you sell that piece of real estate. Normally, outside of the trust, you'd have capital gains if, if you sold it at a profit. Inside the trust, you do not because it's owned by the irrevocable trust. The corpus of the trust owns the property and the policy. So therefore the taxes, the capital gains essentially don't matter like they would outside of the trust. So if that's a benefit and, it, it, and you're somebody that would benefit from this structure and you understand that once the money goes or once the policy and the property goes in there, it can't come out of there, which doesn't matter once you understand it because remember the old saying, own nothing but control everything. So there you go. So that would be uh, a positive for some of you on here. I don't know who. Uh, let's see. Royalties and definitely just curious on your take on this. So I kind of dissect that, dissected that a little bit, Todd. I kind of went you know, piece by piece by piece so that everybody understood kind of what we were talking about. Then there's the family trust and then there's the foundation, which are two pieces I didn't talk about. So hopefully that helps uh, Deborah and Todd. It's a 
big, long, kind of complex thing. But yes, if it makes sense, you could learn more about it. Experience Mastermind is amazing. I haven't missed and don't want to ever. Lifetime member, they just don't know it yet. All right, Deborah, uh, Deborah Brick says 20,000. So again, you know, Deborah works for a company that sets these up. Um, and we're not here to advertise companies, but she's saying if you got 20,000 in taxable, uh, in, in taxes that you're paying, Deborah, I don't mean to disagree, but we can agree to disagree. I think that's not enough. I think the cost for setting up the trust structure, the complexity of setting up the trust structure, and somebody that only has a tax liability of 20 grand, or, or Deborah, are you talking it costs 20 grand to set it up, or are you talking, sorry, I might be talking two different things. Um, she might be saying it costs 20 grand with them to set the structure up. So I don't know. But I, I, I will say one thing, you know, while we're getting to the end of this, I, I don't like when people come on our webinars and try to promote their products. I will say that and try to push their agenda. So not saying that for any other reason other than please don't do that because I would never do that to you. So I respect the fact that you're on here asking good questions and ones that I certainly can answer, but don't come on to our show trying to push something because that's what your company does. Didn't mean to be a dick about that, but got to sometimes set the ground rules. Uh, will you have this seminar again? Yes, we certainly will. Thanks everybody for coming to the self-directed IRA webinar because now this is turning into a trust webinar. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.